Conversely, there have been just over 300,000 um, American students who go abroad. So the numbers are really not comparable. Um, and you're right that some students, you know, truly go abroad and immerse themselves for longer periods of time. And certainly Spain is actually one of the top I'm destinations. Very <laughs> Melting Pot, a global podcast series hosted by Pile, connects guests who have inspiring stories and reaches out to a multicultural audience over 52 countries. Guests are diverse, such as celebrities, entrepreneurs, travelers, and many more who've had a turning point in their lives and moved over to a holistic lifestyle. Follow us on YouTube, Spotify, Apple, Google Podcasts, Podcast social media. Hi, everyone. Uh, today I am in conversation with the lovely Dr. Rachika Bhandari. Uh, Rajika is a PhD. Um, she is, she's so multifaceted. Um, so I've kind of got this little brief mini introduction for her. So she's an international higher education expert, she's an entrepreneur, a keynote speaker. Um, she's an author, a nonprofit executive, and most recently, she's also become a podcast host. Um, so Rajika's recent book, America Calling, a foreign student in a country of possibility, um, has been receiving fabulous reviews. Um, and even I managed to get hold of a copy in the past <laughs> couple of days uh, that I've been in D.C., um, and I've managed to sort of, I, I do admit I haven't read the entire book, but I have most definitely uh, skimmed through it and really enjoyed um, your personal journey there. So thank you so much for joining me today, Rajika. Payal, I'm so delighted to be on your show today. And thank you so much for reaching out and uh, inviting me. For the people who haven't read uh, America Calling, um, if you could just give us a little background to yourself and how you eventually, you know, did this migration and uh, came into the U.S. Sure, absolutely. And, you know, in many ways, the book um, is really capturing not just my journey, and it is a memoir, but it's really been the journey of thousands of uh, Indian immigrants in the US, because it basically captures that period of time where post 1960s in the US, uh, the doors of the country opened up again to immigrants from all over the world world and particularly from India. And that's when we began to see a big influx of people coming to American colleges and universities to study. And almost all of us can think of uncles or aunts or other relatives who came in the 60s and 70s as young students to um, get an education in the US. And many of them went on to become immigrants and really form a part of uh, the very large Indian diaspora in the US now. Others, of course, went back to India, but for the most part, many of them stayed. So in, in many ways, the book is sort of capturing um, uh, that sort of migration and uh, really tells the story of Indian Americans who've made that journey of coming to America's colleges and universities as students and then becoming um, immigrants. And in my case, um, you know, the 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 experience or sort of the original motivation is not unique because as we know thousands of indian students uh, you know certainly of my generation this is a couple of decades ago and even today aspire to go abroad to study and you know um right um, right up in sort of post independence india it was the uk and then it slowly shifted to the us and um and students want to go abroad. And so the same was uh, true for me. And this was back in the early 90s that, you know, I had grown up uh, in a family where one of my grandfathers had studied abroad. Um, I was seeing uncles and aunts leaving to go abroad to study. Um, my father always aspired for me to go abroad. Now, the interesting thing is, I actually never wanted to go abroad to study uh, or to come to the US because in, in the book, I sort of describe it as not wanting to become a fly trapped in American honey. 
And what I mean by that is that the U.S. was always seen as sort of this land of riches and that once you got there, you would be so ensnared that you would not want to leave. And I never want to be I, I never wanted to be confronted with that choice. So I always said, I don't even want to go in the first place. But my father was very eager for me to go because he truly believed that an American education was uh, sort of uh, the very best education that your money could buy. Right. Um, well, fast forward some years and um, I found myself in a relationship. So interestingly enough, what eventually got me to the U.S. was uh, was following in the footsteps of this relationship. And, um, you know, I spent uh, my uh, graduate school years in the state of North Carolina in uh, in uh, the U.S., so the southern part of the U.S., and then fast forward many years later through a very interesting twist of professional fate, you could call it, I found myself in a role where I became immersed in the lives of students who had come to the US just like me. And I became a scholar of studying this sort of migration, as you mentioned, that happens all around the world through the pathway of education. And, um, you know, we often talk, I mean, there are different types of migration. And these days, of course, we're seeing a lot of forced migration, which is unfortunate when we look at refugees. We um, look at other reasons for which people are forced to flee. But the reality is that education is a major reason why people also migrate and often also become immigrants. So that's that's what's really captured in the book. So, you know, as as you have mentioned, I mean, I was obviously listening to while researching you some conversations that you've had and um, you uh, mentioned about you know, um, the difference between uh, the reason why European students would uh, migrate uh, versus an Asian student, you know? So, I mean, there are, I mean, obviously there are cultural differences um, which are pretty marked, um, but what, in your opinion, um, would lead a European student to, or encourage a European student to move in, say, say to come to the US to study or to go anywhere else um, um, versus uh, someone from Asia? Yeah, that is such a great uh, question. And there are some key differences. And um, I think that with, many students from Europe. Now, of course, I mean, I'm generalizing even within yeah, Europe, yeah. there are there are variations. But, but on the whole, if we look at um, both the migration patterns of students, but also immigration patterns, what we find is that most students from Europe, um, when they choose to go abroad, are really going abroad for what we might sort of characterize as the exchange experience. So um, this really, you know, historically also, if we look at um, Europe, there's been a long tradition dating back centuries, you know, before we had borders, before we had yeah. visas for yeah. scholars to um, to cross countries, cross borders, to visit universities. Okay, and sorry, to sorry, I'm going to interrupt you here. Um, which normally if you could add that um where would europeans prefer so let's say students is one category and you mentioned people who are uh, in general immigrants you know mm -hmm. uh, which uh, part of the world would they really really want to to explore and move to yeah, so I don't know that there, so regionally, I think a lot of the exchange that's happened um, for Europe has has really remained within the Western realm. So I would say that many of many European students are drawn primarily to um, to the US. And now again, when we, we talk about Europe, we're talking about an entire continent. Yeah. So there's actually a lot of intra-regional mobility, which to be honest, 
has been very affected by Brexit. So that's been the other complication um, within Europe. But even so, many European students are drawn to countries like the US, countries like Australia, because um, in a larger sense, and certainly linguistically, there's perhaps a sense of familiarity, at least amongst Anglophone countries. But of course, all of your in fact, most of Europe is not Anglophone. Yeah. Uh, Anglophone. Um, but sort of going back to the motivations, there's really this um, uh, historically this um, you know desire to sort of go abroad, learn about other cultures, to be an exchange student in other universities, and then to come back having sort of had that experience. And so the reason I mentioned immigration rates is that that's also reflected in immigration patterns here in the U.S. That when we look at what sorts of students have stayed on in the U.S. after their studies and say become immigrants, we find that most Europeans have gone back or a larger proportion have gone back. But when we look at Asian students, there's a real difference in motivation and it can almost be characterized as sort of educational migration for opportunity. So the idea that they're going abroad, not just for the sort of feel good sense of, you know, learning about different cultures, but it's really about the educational opportunity that again, you know, what is the best education that we can get? And how can that education be a pathway to professional opportunity? And we see that very clearly reflected in the choices that many Asian students make. Um, uh, if we look at stay rates in the US, or again, sort of who stayed on, who's become a skilled immigrant, very large proportions of Chinese students, of Indian students stay back in the US. In fact, um, over the past few decades, the, the stay rates have remained almost at somewhere between 70 to 80%, which means that for every 10 students from India coming yeah. to the US, seven or eight of them will, yeah. will stay on. So I think those are sort of the fundamental differences and uh, are therefore also reflected in um, what students choose to study. Most Asian students will come for, in fact, all of them will almost come for full degree programs. They'll pursue their bachelor's or their master's or their PhD. That's not the case for all European students. Many of them may come for shorter programs of study or just for part of their studies, because again, it's within the exchange model uh, very often. So I think, yeah, that those, those are some of the key differences. Is there like a reverse um, migration of students happening from the US as well? Not as much. And you've actually touched upon something that's of huge concern within US higher education and amongst American colleges and universities, and which is that how to get more young American students to go abroad, how to get them to be more globally minded. And um, there's been a big movement underway for the past couple of decades to, to really try and move the needle on that. And if we look at sheer numbers, um, overall numbers, no, the, the, there's, there's a huge gap. So, you know, of course, the numbers have been affected by COVID, but even so, over the past couple of years, you know, we could say there have been about a million um, or just under a million students from all over the world flocking to uh, American institutions. Conversely, there have been just over 300,000 um, American students who go abroad. So the numbers, are really not comparable. Um, and you're right that some students, you know, truly go abroad and immerse themselves for longer periods of time. And certainly Spain is actually one of the top very destinations. Popular. <laughs> yeah. Very popular, yeah. Along, yeah. With the, <laughs> along with Italy and the UK uh, for, uh, for, you know, all of the reasons that one can imagine. Um, and American students are very drawn to European countries. And indeed, some of them will uh, truly immerse themselves and, and uh, obtain entire degrees, but those numbers are few and far between because by and large what we see is sort of what you described earlier, very much of that short term, very short term period of uh, of going abroad. And, you know, there's a debate within the field that, you know, should, that is it 
what constitutes true immersion and should we keep yeah. sort of insisting that students um, uh, and that is real study abroad only a sort of more longer term immersive experience or is it sufficient for students to even go abroad for a few months as long as we can get more students to go abroad so when we talk about asia uh, the one country which again is is also my home um singapore um mm -hmm. is you know has uh, when it comes to education um it's got top notch universities and there's a very very um strong focus on you know i mean the kind of faculty that that comes uh, the people that uh, the universities, um, you know, the professors that they hire are all, you know, with absolutely uh, uh, the top level education and experience. So why is it that um, the American um, students don't, because Asia is a big draw for, you know, a lot of people, I'm, I'm referring to Southeast Asia specifically, uh, for a lot of, um, you know, young people to, to travel within Asia and, and make a base somewhere. So why is a country like Singapore not on the map uh, for American students? Yeah, and before I address that, I just want to clarify that I was uh, presenting that as perhaps one reason why more American students are not going abroad. I don't think it's the right reason. I do think that it's myopic for students to think that just because they have the world's best colleges and universities, there's no need for them to go abroad. I think okay. they absolutely need to go abroad because there is so much that comes from that learning that yeah. goes beyond academics. And in fact, I capture a lot of that in my in my book on um, how through my experiences, uh, being an international student, how you're also helping educate your fellow American students about the rest of the world. So I just I just wanted to be clear about that, that I'm not advocating that that students, American students don't go abroad. They absolutely need to because they're not going to learn about the rest of the world otherwise. So um, that is a great question. I agree with you. Why is Singapore not more attractive? Because um, given that there's no language barrier, for sure, yeah. Um, I wonder if it is lack of information, because I, I agree with you that Singapore should be absolutely on the map of every American student, but I wonder um, if through marketing and promotion, because sort of, and what I mean by that is that globally what we find is that countries that are interested in attracting more international students have huge market their governments have huge marketing and publicity campaigns around this where they're sending the message loud and clear that we're open to students from around the world they have all sorts of incentives and policies to attract international students and I wonder if there's a gap there that why are students not seeing Singapore as a viable alternative? Because you're right with with uh, you know um, uh, English not being with language not being a barrier, it being such an advanced and developed nation state, um, excellent standards of education with you know. Um, I'm thinking of Yale and US and uh, all of the other institutions um, in, in Singapore. Um, I don't know, it's a good question. I think there was probably some more awareness of it when there was the partnership between Yale and uh, NUS. Um, but it's a good question. I wonder if it has to do with sort of uh, uh, not seeing Singapore as offering sort of a more liberal education environment, but I, I don't know. I'd say I don't have an answer to that, but I completely yeah. agree with you that there are countries like Singapore that ought to absolutely be on the map of, uh, of uh, every American student. Uh, mentioned that you're an entrepreneur and you're also a nonprofit executive. So I'm kind of curious to know um, what kind of a role you play for both of these um, um, 
expertise that you have kind of put down? So, so I had a I had a very long career with a very venerable international education nonprofit, arguably the largest nonprofit in the U.S. in international education, called uh, the Institute of International Education, which uh, globally is also known for running the Fulbright program for the U.S. government. And I was with IIE for almost 14 years, and that's where I really sort of developed my expertise in um, working on issues around international students and global student mobility. And so for many years, I was um, an executive uh, with an sort of rose through the ranks and levels of seniority in the nonprofit sector with IIE, and then um, went on to do a couple of other different things also in the nonprofit sector um, and then took a bit of a, um, you know, I don't want to say it was due to the pandemic, but maybe it was a confluence of different things, but found myself um, going down the role of uh, becoming a consultant. This was um, uh, early 2000s, so about a year, a little over a year ago. And all the while thinking of it as a stopgap arrangement, because I was between roles and between jobs and sort of still being the, the sort of uh, good, pragmatic Indian that I am, um, I had to, of course, go find the next job because, of course, I'd been raised to believe that how can you not have that nine to five job with, you know, the right title and the right benefits and with a prestigious organization. So, um so spent some time sort of trying to figure out what would be my next move. And in the meantime, found that my business was really taking off. And that's when I had to sort of take a step back and say that maybe the universe is trying to tell me something here. And that sort of led to setting up my own consulting firm almost exactly a year ago, kind of making it official for myself. And it's been the most interesting, I have to say, possibly the most interesting pivot I've made in my life where I would never have imagined even just two years ago that I'm going to be, um, you know, not leading in the traditional sense of kind of yeah. being a leader in a nonprofit, but being a leader in my sector in different ways. And then the book came out um, last September. And what was really interesting was seeing how, which I'd never anticipated or intended, that the book, how the book began to intersect with my professional work and led to some really, and continues to lead to some really interesting opportunities. And what was most important was that being an entrepreneur and being independent really helped me have a voice on issues that I care about, that the book is about. Um, in ways that I could not have had if I were leading an organization or speaking for an, for an entity organization. So, yeah. So um, thank you so much. It's just been a um, very, very kind of stimulating conversation. And I really enjoyed talking to you. And um, I'm happy that we were able to get connected. Um, and good luck uh, with, you know, whatever you're pursuing. And I'm sure it's going to go really, really well. Thank you so much, Payal. It's been lovely, lovely chatting with you and getting to know you. And I've been listening to your show and uh, really been enjoying it. So thank you again for having me. Thank you. Thank you. For more weekly conversations, do listen to Melting Pot on Spotify, Apple and Google Podcasts. Follow us on YouTube and on Instagram at Podcast Melting Pot. So until the next episode, this is Pyle signing off.